In this video, we're going to discuss how we would conduct a cost-benefit analysis for different renewable energy technologies. So to begin with, we'll recap how to estimate capital costs associated with different renewable energy sources, particularly wind and solar. We'll look at something that's a little bit more specific and can be used for direct comparison called the levelized cost of electricity. We'll then discuss some of the potential hidden costs associated with the uptake of renewables, and we'll finish by discussing the potential benefits. So in an earlier tutorial, we looked at how we could determine the capital cost for both a wind farm and a solar power plant. And we'll just review that data now for completeness. So to begin with, we looked at some data from the local government association, and we looked at sizing turbines based on two different sets of data. First of all, we assumed that we were going to have a wind farm with an average output of 20 megawatts, which meant when we took capacity factor into consideration, we needed a wind farm with a capacity or a rated power output of 67 megawatts. Now the two scenarios we used was 67 one megawatt turbines or 27 two and a half megawatt turbines. And from the data, we found that the cost would range between 89 million pounds and 134 million pounds, depending on the type of turbine. The reason the larger turbines equated to a lower cost was because we have economies of scale. Larger turbines tend to be cheaper per megawatt of power. We did a similar estimate using a second set of data, and this time our data was from a consultancy called Renewables First, and this time we looked at using one and a half megawatt turbines, of which we needed 45, and that gave us an initial cost or a capital outlay of 122 million pounds. And we also looked at using two and a half megawatt turbines, requiring 27 of them, giving us a capital outlay of 84 million pounds. Now from all of those different sets of data, we could see that the average cost of our 67 megawatt capacity installation was going to be somewhere in the order of 100 to 110 million pounds. Next, we repeated the process for a solar farm. And once again, our objective was to create a solar power plant with an average power output of 20 megawatts. We took the capacity factor into account and that meant that we needed a solar power plant with a rated power output or a capacity of 200 megawatts. We then used various sets of data, the first from the Solar Trade Association, which gave us an estimated capital cost of 157 million, so somewhat higher than the wind farm. And we repeated that using data from the Government Department of Energy and Climate Change, and we came up with a figure of around 155 million, so not a huge amount of difference between the two estimates. So next we looked at something called the levelized cost of electricity. And the difference with the levelized cost of electricity is it takes running costs into account. So both a wind farm and a solar power plant would have a life cycle or a working life cycle of 25 years. And what the levelized cost of electricity does is it looks at all of the costs across that life cycle and then it factors in the amount of energy that's being produced. So we need to look at the total lifetime cost. Now in our comparison, the amount of energy that both our wind farm and our solar power plant was going to produce was equal because our average power output was 20 megawatts. Therefore, what we were really interested in was the total cost. So we'll have a look at that data now and then we'll discuss in a bit more detail how we would factor in the power output if the power outputs were different. So first of all, reviewing our wind farm data, we said if we used two and a half megawatt turbines, we would need 27 of them. And if we used one and a half megawatt turbines, we would need 45 of them. And what this table gives us is the average operating and maintenance costs for each of those turbines. So if we take, for example, the two and a half megawatt turbine, with an annual cost of around £102,000. In total, for 27 turbines, that's an additional £2.7 million. So if we're looking at the true cost associated with our wind farm and our solar farm, 
we should really take into account these additional annual costs when we consider the overall cost during the lifetime of the wind farm or the solar power plant. Now the other thing that needs to be considered for levelised cost of electricity is the energy production. Now as mentioned, both of our plants were producing the same amount of electricity or the same average amount of power, therefore it wasn't necessary to factor this in. But in actual fact, to get a true levelised cost of electricity, we need to take the overall cost over the full life cycle of the turbine or the solar power plant and divide it by its total energy production. So in effect what we have is cost per unit of energy produced. So if we refer to this diagram here, on our y-axis we see the levelised cost of electricity in pounds spent over the life cycle of the turbine per megawatt hour of energy produced, so cost per unit of energy. So it means we can compare projects of different sizes as well as comparing different technologies. Now when we factored in all of these additional costs as well as the amount of energy that we could produce, we noticed a couple of things. First of all, in 2018, we noticed that the cost of a large scale solar farm was higher than an onshore wind farm, but lower than an offshore wind farm. Now, if we project forward to the year 2020, we see the cost of the onshore wind farm and the solar power plant coming together. The costs of those two are very, very similar. So in the present day, 2018, we still see that the solar farm is more expensive, but as time progresses, we actually see that the cost of the solar farm drops below the cost of the other technologies, both the onshore wind farm, the offshore wind farm, and the production of electricity from gas. Now recall that we're trying to phase out the use of gas because it's burning of fossil fuels and it creates carbon dioxide. So from these projections, it would appear that solar power is going to be the preferential energy source from around 2023 onwards, both in terms of cost and the fact that it's a clean renewable energy source. Now the other thing that we mentioned here was we have an additional line for the wholesale cost of electricity. And this is basically the market price of electricity. Now the observation we made was all of the technologies, both the renewables and the gas, had a cost higher than the value of that electricity. Now what this means is all of these energy production mechanisms would need to be subsidised by the government, both the renewables and the non-renewables. And you might ask the question, why does the government subsidise that? Well, imagine if we was in a situation where no company was prepared to produce new generating capacity because there wasn't sufficient income based on their production and the long-term impacts that would have on our economy. So if no one was producing new electricity and our demand increased, then very soon we would have an energy crisis. So the government provides subsidies to make up this shortfall and ensure that the companies can make some profit. And we'll talk a bit more about that next. But it's government subsidies that makes this whole system work, particularly when the cost of producing electricity is higher than the value that that electricity can be sold for. So I've chosen to call this the hidden costs associated with renewables uptake because so far we've only looked at the cost in the context of the company that's building the power plant. But what we've just alluded to is there must be additional costs, otherwise we wouldn't have any new generating capacity. So the way the government incentivizes energy companies to increase generating capacity or to build power plants is using something called contracts for difference or CFD. And these contracts for difference replace the renewables obligation that we spoke about in earlier tutorials. So the renewables obligation finished in March 2017 and was replaced with contracts for difference. And contracts for difference are contracts between government agencies and the companies that are producing the electricity. Now the way that the government ensures that energy companies are going to get enough income from the energy they produce is using something called administrative strike prices. Now we said that the value of electricity in the wholesale market was around 6 pence per kilowatt hour or 60 pounds per megawatt hour. But the administrative strike price is a value higher than that and what it means is that the government will make up the difference between the wholesale price and the strike price. 
So let's say, for example, the wholesale price is £60 per megawatt. Then the government may set a strike price for a particular renewable energy technology at £100 per megawatt hour. Therefore, the company will sell their electricity in the wholesale market and generate £60 per megawatt hour, but that will be topped up by the government or government agencies to £100 in order to ensure that they can cover their costs and produce electricity at a profit. Now the statements that I'm going to read here are from a document produced by the Department of Energy and Climate Change and this document is called the CFD Supplier Obligation which we'll talk about a little bit more in a moment. I'm also going to provide links to these documents underneath the video if you're logged into the study platform. And I'm just going to pick up in the first paragraph here as this explains in a bit more detail what these contracts for difference do and what they are. So it says CFDs are designed to give investors the confidence and certainty they need to invest in low carbon electricity generation, helping the UK electricity sector to attract greater investment in low carbon generation and reduce the UK's carbon emissions. So without these CFDs, investors wouldn't be prepared to put their money into renewable energy projects because there wouldn't be enough profit to even cover their costs. It then goes on to say, CFDs work by stabilising the prices received by low carbon generation, reducing the risks they face and ensuring that every technology receives a price for its power that supports investment. So as we mentioned, it's a way of topping up the wholesale price. It then goes on to explain what it means by the strike price. So it says CFDs pay the generator the difference between a measure of the cost of investing in a particular low carbon technology, this is what we call the strike price, and a measure of the average market price for the electricity, the reference price. Now another name for the reference price is the wholesale price. It then goes on to say while still requiring the generator to participate in the electricity market, including selling their power in the normal way. So as we said before, the company will still sell their electricity in the wholesale market, but then their income will be topped up to the strike price to ensure that there's enough money to cover costs and also to encourage investment. So this diagram here shows strike prices from 2014 to 2018, and we're going to look in particular at our onshore wind and our large scale solar. So here we see, first of all, for onshore wind, a strike price of around £100 and then dropping to around £95. So when we did our income projections earlier and we said that the income that the wind farm would generate was equivalent to six pence per kilowatt hour, in actual fact, until recently, that price would be nearer 10 pence per kilowatt hour or £100 per megawatt hour. So almost double the wholesale value. Now the picture for solar is a little better for our solar power plant because the strike prices in 2014 were around £127, £128, in 2016 dropping to £120 and still in 2018 sitting at around £105. Now we saw that the costs associated with solar were higher and that's why the strike price is higher to encourage people to invest in that technology and continue to expand our renewable provision. Now you might be left wondering, well if it's not generating profit, then why would we continue to expand? But these are all still relatively new technologies. We saw in earlier tutorials that how over time the cost of these technologies will come down. And we have an obligation to generate clean energy, but we need to get to that point where it's profitable to do so. So now we have an understanding of how the government tops up the income from renewable energy generation, but next we need to consider where that money comes from. So we have something called the supplier obligation and any electricity supplier in the UK is required to pay a levy or a tax called the supplier obligation and that money is then used to feed the contracts for difference. And I'm just going to pick up on a couple of sentences from the document we saw earlier. So in the first paragraph it reads the payments to be made to generators will be calculated and paid out by the counterparty, a government-owned limited company. So it's a government company. The counterparty, which we've just said is government-owned, 
will receive funds for the CFD payments from suppliers. So the money's coming from the suppliers in order to feed the CFD payments. And it receives those payments through the supplier obligation. The supplier obligation is a compulsory levy. A levy is just a tax and is likely to be classified as a direct tax. Now in the paragraph below, picking up here, it says the government would introduce a statutory obligation on suppliers to make payments to the counterparty to fund the payments that are due under CFDs to generators. So as mentioned before, it's actually the energy suppliers that are funding the CFDs that are funding the renewable energy technologies. So the last piece in the puzzle is how do the suppliers get that money? And unfortunately, the way that the suppliers will get that additional income to cover that additional tax is by increasing the bills of customers and consumers. So the hidden costs, if you like, are the costs to individuals or the consumers that are using the electricity. And you've probably noticed in recent years that the cost of electricity is steadily increasing. Interestingly, it's not because the wholesale price is increasing drastically. It's because that additional income is being used to fund renewables projects. Now, I don't want to finish on a negative note, so let's look at the benefits associated with the uptake of renewables. Now, the first benefit is obviously the environmental benefit of not producing carbon dioxide, not causing global warming, and all of the problems that go along with global warming. And I've written in brackets there, is that a benefit or is it a need? Is it something we have to do or is it something that we would just like to do? Now, I think the overwhelming evidence suggests that it's something that we have to do. And we are all partially responsible for the problems we're facing with climate change as we're all consumers of electricity and the majority of us drive and catch planes and so on. So we are all partially responsible. Now, the other thing to consider is the political benefits and how the UK positions their self globally. Now, we saw right at the very start of this unit that things such as the Rio Earth Summit dictated the UK's behaviour in terms of their uptake of renewable energies and their reduction of CO2 emissions. But once again, is that a benefit? Is it just a benefit the way different countries view us, or was it a need? Did we need a culture shift where all countries began to adopt renewable energy technologies? And that's just something for you to ponder. Now, finally, we have the financial benefits for the generators and their investors. There is still profit to be made, Otherwise, they wouldn't build this new renewable energy technology. So there is benefits to both the energy generation companies and to anyone who invests in those technologies. Unfortunately, as we mentioned, that money inevitably comes from the consumers or the customers. But that said, it's that money that drives the whole process and has enabled the UK to expand its renewable energy provision and be well on its way to meeting its global targets.